All right, we're back in crazy, not crazy, brilliant. Uh, mm -hmm. Eric Myers team, and of course Bart DeSmet. Yep. Um, people out there know you, but go ahead and introduce yourself for everybody. To tell them know what you're doing these days. Okay, so I'm Bart DeSmet. I used to work, you know, in WPF before I got here. Yes. Um, and I was doing all sorts of, you know, crazy or brilliant, as you call it, yeah. of the Blink provider. Yes. So, I actually came to Eric's team to actually huh? work on Link to Everything, which Link is to everything. our extended mission. Excellent. Now, yep. we had you in an expert to expert when you were on a different team. Yep. And in fact, I, I titled it Link to Everything because you had done Link to your good friend right there, Bart oh, yeah. Simpson, which is very interesting. Yep. So let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit today about, you know, technically what you've done and how it mm -hmm. relates to Rx. Okay. So, so there are a couple of things to be to be told here. So first of all, what we see in Link is like the glue to sort of glue together everything in the cloud, um, which is like our extended mission. People might not know that the RX team is part of something called cloud programmability. Yes. And so what we do there is all sorts of things. And what people are seeing now is the tip of an iceberg, sort of. Excellent. You know. um, so as we see Link as, you know, the glue to sort of, you know, do computation in the cloud, to do data access in the cloud, we need to enable, you know, the ability for people to actually write link providers to everything. Mm -hmm. So what we sort of do is creating, you know, tools that actually enable people to do so. Um, now that we have Rx, well, Rx is a different kind of data model. It's not like the enumerable kind, it's the observable kind. It's, it's basically, you know, a push-based model. Well, that's also something that you should be able to remote into the cloud. And you basically say, well, I have some data source and it's like, for example, an RSS feed or a Twitter feed. Mm. Well, that's something that's observable. Now, if your server supports like a filter server site and then they'll talk back to you mm. to basically just give the results that you're interested in, well, why can't we actually remote the where class and maybe select class and group by and all of that stuff into the cloud? So that's actually what we're going to talk about today, all right. which is essentially the dual. Again, you know, like oh, yeah. I have enumerable I like duals. Yes. Um, there is an I enumerable, but there is also an I queryable, which is like, you know, um, I will explain it on the whiteboard. It's a homo iconic form of I enumerable. It means that it's basically an interpretable form of queries mm -hmm. over the enumerable sequence. Now, on the other side, we have I observable. So yeah, something is missing here. Yes. You know, like the homo iconic form to I observable and the dual form to I queryable. So that's the thing that we introduced today. And what are you calling that? That's called iQueryable Observable. iQueryable Observable. Yes, but it's abbreviated. So you don't write... I, I, you don't write... You iQ. Know, yes, it's actually... Yeah, it, it's also iQ, but that's the same as iQueryable. Good so point. It's sort of, you know... So the way we call it is iQubeservable. So the O actually gets an additional attachment. And the attachment is sort of the arrow into the cloud, like if you really think about it. So you guys are really going off the, off the chain with uh, duality. Yes, I mean, exactly. I was no. on an email late one night, not mm -hmm. too long ago there, and it's occurred to me that essentially um, .NET is a duel of com. Mm -hmm. Maybe so. Yeah. But back on in reality, this is amazing. So let's go ahead, get mm -hmm. on the whiteboard, yep. and dig into what you've done. Exactly. And, and start talking about you know where it makes sense. Okay, sounds good. Right on. Yep. So... Actually, where I want to start is sort of show like the axes that we sort of have in our X today. Excellent. So um, I'm going to write a three-dimensional diagram and I'm going to show that one dimension is nothing today. Okay. So we're going to add one dimension to that, which will be the equitable stuff. So if you take a look at the different axes that we have, one axis is actually about what you want to query. And mm -hmm. this what domain actually is divided into two sections. You have one section that's actually the enumerable kind, which is the pool-based model. So that's what we have over here. So this is pool. It's called interactive. So we have interactive extensions for that, which is an extension to link to object. And it's actually also synchronous typically. It means that you have that get enumerator thing. You have move next. You actually call that thing and you're blocked while you're actually acquiring the data. So that's basically the ID there. Now, besides that, we also have push. And the push model is what we have in Rx. It's the iObservable kind of interface. And it's typically asynchronous. It's basically a way to orchestrate asynchronous computation. Hmm. It's not so much about, you know, data. It, it happens to be data. Sure. But it's also about orchestrating asynchronous stuff. Like if you do, like, dictionary suggest in the cloud, you're basically writing a query with two from classes. 
The second from class will be triggered whenever the first one fires. So your mm. whole query remains asynchronous under composition. So that's basically why, why this matters. Excellent. So that, that's actually the difference between those two. That's a great description. Mm -hmm. So let's actually draw a dotted line here because this is a dis discrete domain. There are only two kinds. Either the data comes to you or the data has to be requested. So either you pull it out or it's getting pushed in. So that's basically the difference there. Now those two are actually related by means of duality. Okay? And we have two implementations here. We have I enumerable, actually not implementations, but interfaces. We have IE of T and we have IO of T. So those are the two interfaces that everyone knows about today. Okay. Now it turns out that we also have a second axis today. Hmm. Like, I'm going to introduce a third one today, <laughs> but we actually have a second one. Okay. And the second one is about where you execute things. And I will actually draw this one here because the main discussion will be the third axis and that will be up here. Okay. So this axis, the where axis, is actually all about concurrency. Hmm. Because, like, if you do, for example, a pool-based stream and you have an operator like AMP, AMP is basically the ambiguous operator, where you basically want to say, well, Please pull two things simultaneously, and the first thing that actually responds will be my outcome. Hmm. But like, if you have two of those sequences, and you're actually going to pull at the two, and you know this guy is going to win the race because it produces results first, if you want to do AMP between those two guys, you need concurrency. Because if you start pulling at this thing, move next, you will be blocked. Hmm. So you can't actually do this one in parallel. So you need to execute this one in one place and that one in yet another place. So you need parallelism. And that is actually, you know, where you observe things or where you run things. Mm -hmm. So that's actually the axis of concurrency. And so this corresponds to um, the notion that we have in our X of I scheduler, which is a very simple interface that just has, you know, something that takes in an action and that will be the thing that will be executed. And the place where it executes is dependent on the implementation of I scheduler. So, for example, you have multi-threading. We have support for, you know, worker pools. I will indicate those like this. Like, for example, the task pool, the thread pool. You have things like, you know, message loops for, like, synchronization on the UI threads. Mm -hmm. But you can also do distributed stuff here. Like, you could say, I have a cluster of machines, and I'm basically going to remote the action that's passed to the scheduler to some machine in the cluster. Mm -hmm. And then that thing is going to execute. So you could actually realize all of that stuff using our scheduler. So that's the generalization of where you execute things. Now, one thing is missing here, and that's actually the vertical axis. That's about how you execute stuff. Mm. Now, in this particular case, IE of T and IO of T have lots of operators. They have like 50 or 100 operators, and they are implemented in IL code. They're implemented to execute Locally, if you will, but local sort of has a feeling of where, so I'm not going to use that word too much here. Okay. So it's IL code, and I would say it executes verbatim, right? It's basically going to execute whatever you wrote locally. Like, because if you write something like axis.where, x goes to x% percent to equals zero to get the even numbers, this thing if you operate against I enumerable or I observable, will actually be turned into an anonymous method that executes locally. So this will be IL code that represents this build. Okay. Local execution. Now, say that you want to go to SQL with link, you need some notion of remoting or basically translating. Remoting is, is an orthogonal aspect in some sense. You want to be able to cross translate what the user wrote into some target domain. Hmm. And that's what actually the iQueryable is about. So we already have that thing sitting over here. In you know, classic link, we have iQueryable of T. And iQueryable of T is also an iEnumerable of T. Hmm. I'll explain the relations between all of those guys in just a second. But so what this is about, it's about representing your query using expression trees. And it's about, I would say, translatable or interpretable execution meaning you get what the user wrote and you can do whatever you want. You could even compile it back to IL code if you want so. Mm. You could optimize it before you compile it to IL code, or you could translate into these SQL statements or you know, SharePoint camel or Active Directory filters or all of that stuff. So that's actually what we have there. And the way those two are related 
And again, it's a discrete domain, I should say, like there are only two ways. Either you do it literally or you translate, right? There's nothing in the middle. Um, so this is also two discrete domains. And the way those are connected is by that difficult word I used before called homo-iconicity. Mm -hmm. And what that actually is, is people who know Lisp know quotations. Okay. In Lisp, you can write a lambda function or something, and you can either look at it as code or as data. If you quote it, you will get a data representation of what the user wrote. Okay. So this is actually a property that exists in C Sharp. And um, the reader, or you know, the watcher, not the reader, should actually try to take this lambda expression and try to assign it to an implicitly typed variable. It won't work. Mm -hmm. Like if you take this thing and you do like var f equals the expression, yeah, it won't work. And the reason is that this thing can be assigned to two possible, two different things. It can either be assigned to func of something, or it can be assigned to a expression of func of something. When you assign it to a func of something, in this case, int to bool, you will actually get IL code. If you assign it to an expression of a func from int to bool, you will get an expression tree that represents the code that you wrote as data. Mm. So that at runtime, you can actually inspect it. So in this particular case, assume that this where class, or this where method, doesn't take in a func but an expression of a func, what it will receive is not an IL code body, but it will receive instead some expression tree that looks like lambda of x goes to modulo of x, no, not modulo here, equals of modulo of x percent 2 equals 0. Hmm. So you get a data structure that represents the code that user just wrote. Okay. And so if you have that thing, well, you can interpret it. You can translate into everything you want. Like, you are not stuck to a L code. You could actually do it without expression trees as well if you would have a runtime decompilation service like .NET Reflector at runtime. Okay. You sort of would get you know the IL code that the user wrote and then we try to reconstruct what the user wrote <laughs> in terms of a tree, but that's kind of ugly. Sure. So we have expression trees right inside C sharp and VB to accommodate for that. Beautiful. So that's what homo iconicity means is basically just that you can take the same syntax. Okay. And depending on where you assign it to, you don't have to change anything in what the user writes. It just writes exactly the same query. It either turns into IL code or it turns into expression trace. Okay. So that's how those two domains are related. Now let's also draw a couple of arrows between all of those guys. The nice thing is that you can go back and forth between all of those. So I enumerable to I observable you can do. We have a two observable operator. And vice versa, you can do it as well. You can take an observable and look at it as an enumerable. Hmm. If you do Enumerable to observable, using to observable, it's basically going to pull on your behalf and push things out. If you do the opposite direction, somebody is going to pull things that are being pushed in here. So we have to buffer a little bit because this thing might go slower than this thing pumps and values. But so we have the glue operators and they are called to as a prefix because they're changing sort of the representation. Meaning that you come from, you know, different domain, right? Like if you do a two string on an int, it's totally different. It's total, totally different representation. Sure. It's the same here. You know, an observable and an enumerable are dual. Like it, it's a hard thing to go from one to the other in some sense. But I, let's talk about that though. Version. Because the, the, you know, a string is not the dual of an int. No, it isn't. So it has, this has, you have a little bit more like formalized mm -hmm. connection. Right mm -hmm. from, the, yes. from a lambda yeah, yeah, yeah. calculus perspective, or yep. for, I mean mm -hmm. the way that you have actually, mm -hmm. but that's an interesting topic. I mean yep. the way that you that two, mm -hmm. two, a dual, yeah, is interesting. But you said it's also complicated. Yeah, okay. well, yeah, that there needs to be a little bit of infrastructure to support it. Of so course. it's not just you know <laughs> looking at it from a different angle. It's like putting buffers in place and stuff, a certain right. synchronization. So it's kind of an operation that requires work. So two is like, it, it tells you that something is happening. Certainly, certainly. Stopped. So on the vertical side, you can also do conversion. Every okay. like variable actually is an I enumerable. So it's simple to go from one to the other. Though there is actually a method called as enumerable on I query. Hmm. And that's an interesting one because it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything. Like, so the way it's actually <laughs> implemented is, it takes an IQ and it goes to IE. Okay. Every IQ is an IE. 
So the implementation of this guy, if this thing is x, the implementation of the method will be return x. It doesn't do anything. It, it simply does a cast, you know, a cast from i variable to enumerable. Mm. Uh, why does it do so? Well, if you have a link to SQL query, for example, like you from x in axis, and axis is a table that lives on a SQL database. You're going to write a lot of query stuff over here, and all of a sudden, you know, all of this stuff will execute uh, remotely on the mm. server. Now you want to go to local execution mode at some point. You want to do like a filter client side because it's a filter that SQL doesn't support. The way you do so is by doing as enumerable, and the result of that will be an unenumerable, meaning that all subsequent method calls like where and select and all of those guys will bind against the enumerable extension methods. And the difference between the equitable and the enumerable extension methods is that the enumerable ones take in their predicates as IL code, while those guys take their predicates in as expression trees. Interesting. So if you want to break the remoting, you have to do this. Mm -hmm. We could do without as enumerable if we let people actually write something like this instead. I enumerable of something, mm. which is weird because you can't always write this thing. If this is an anonymous type here that you're using in the select, you can't write this cast. So as enumerable actually helps out with that. The implementation is trivial. It's simply to direct the type mm. so that the type is less specific and the compiler will choose different overloads of extension methods. But that's actually what's happening there. So we have this translation here, um, as enumerable, which is trivial. And we also have the opposite one. And we had this one since .NET 3.5, as queryable. That means that you take a local sequence, like for example, an array 1, 2, 3. And now you say as queryable. That means that everything you write below this point will be represented as expression trees. Hmm. That means you could actually inspect that expression tree and do optimization or something, and ultimately you do back as enumerable, and then you can execute it locally. So this expression tree, it's actually this homoiconicity that's happening here. You go up, up the diagram, that basically forces you to write expression trees, and that happens transparently. You don't have to change the query at all. The syntax is the same. That's what this thing means. Mm -hmm. And then if you go back the opposite direction, that expression tree gets compiled at runtime into local IL code. It's like just an additional round trip that you're making. Mm. And because you're making the round trip, you can inspect the code in the query optimization, all of that stuff if you want to do so. Or you could remote that query somewhere else. Like you could pick up the expression tree and transpose it to another machine if you want to do so. So the thing that we're missing, obviously, is the thing that's sitting here. <laughs> and that's what we're introducing, finally. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, I queryable observable. Mm. And I queryable observable is written like this. You have I observable of T. To make it queryable, you make this a key. We didn't want to write long thing, so we say I could observable or I queryable observable pronounce is the interface name. I could observable. Yes. But we won't be able to say I queryable observable. Yes. It's just, you know, the thing is too long. And in some sense, it's a pity that I queryable, mm -hmm. it's a general notion, right? The ability to, to query something. That shouldn't be related to I enumerable of T. It should not be related to I observable of T either. It should simply be the general notion of querying. Mm. But this interface is actually undernamed in some sense. Like it's I queryable, but it doesn't account for the what access, which didn't exist at that point. So that's the reason it was named sure. such. So actually, you should think about this one as I queryable enumerable, the old one. Okay. And so what we have now is we have uh, translations between all of those as well. So you can take a local I observable and you can actually go up here by doing S queryable okay. observable and then you will actually have things, you know, executing remotely. You can go the opposite direction. Every I queryable observable is an observable. So if you do like, for example, like here you have link to SQL, here you could do link to WMI events or link to PowerShell. If you do this particular direction, you're basically going to execute the query remotely, Okay. you know, in this domain. And you're basically going to consume the data locally. Now, where you execute it is sort of, again, a little bit orthogonal to this as well. Mm. It's not the fact that I translated the query into some domain that it means that it needs to execute remotely. This is simply the ability to look at the query. This is where you execute it. 
Okay. So basically where like a table of TM link to SQL is typically tied to a data context, which has a connection string, here you can sort of write, you know, queries that are independent of the location. They just have all the static type info. And then you could use, you know, things based on a scheduler to say on which machine to run it. So it's sort of, we make this thing orthogonal, which wasn't the case before. It's sort of an additional concern there. Sure. So what we have here are the S operators. And we also have the two operators here. Mm -hmm. So you can actually take a queryable and make it queryable observable, which is push to pull, pull to push. And opposite, you can also do, you know, push to pull, which is, you know, going from a queryable observable to an I queryable. And that's if the provider supports it. Mm. Like you shouldn't try it on a link to SQL thing, because SQL only has the ability to pull things out using PDS and data reading and that stuff. Interesting. Like there's no way to tell the database, like, I would like to get those results. Please send them to me whenever you're ready. You will be sitting and blocked on, you know, the data reader that's listening to the TDS pipe for things to come out. Interesting. There's no notification mechanism. There is a change notification mechanism, but that doesn't travel with data. It simply says that something has been invalidated. So it's a different model. But so this diagram, as you see, is fully commuting. You can do every single thing. Like you can go from everywhere to everywhere, which is very nice. Mm -hmm. Today, without this guy, you could actually write, you have a link to SQL query. Link to SQL queries are always pool based, but you could observe them using our two observable. And the way that will work is well, we will actually pull on your behalf somewhere on the scheduler. And when the results are ready, we'll push them out. So you can do a asynchronous data binding using this thing for every existing link provider. Hmm. Now, if that link provider would support pushing things actually from the cloud, because this thing is, you know, a different place or a different, you know, domain. If there would be a way for SQL to put things at you, you could, instead of walking this direction, you could also walk this direction. Basically saying, you know, I know SQL is pulling, but um, is pulling, please push it to something in the cloud that then will push it to me, hmm. like a forward service. Meaning that you actually have additional concurrency in the cloud to basically do this pull to push adaption, but you don't have to pay the price locally. You could actually remote things this way as well. So we have all right. the possible directions in this diagram. Amazing, man. So that's basically the whole thing. <laughs> um, Very well explained, I yeah. must say. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess we should take a look at the interfaces. Let's take a look at the interfaces. Yep. But I think, you know, I, mean, I just, you know, this is a very clear explanation of what's going on here. And basically what you've done is you've essentially completed the puzzle. Mm -hmm. for asynchronous kind of uh, push-based cloud computing because mm -hmm. that is what's critical here. Exactly. What has been added mm -hmm. to your cloud component, mm -hmm. as you can see clearly in your picture, is iQuobservable. Yes. But we got to work on that name, brother. It's and, called iQuobservable. Observable. It's just contract. But I mean, okay, but even then, I think we could probably come up mm -hmm. with a cooler name, but, but yeah. that's fine. That's fine. Mm -hmm. The RX is super cool. Of course, RX is the bigger, bigger story. Yeah. Excellent, man. So let's now look at a real mm -hmm. use of this. I mean, we got yep. the theory down. Uh -huh. I think everybody out there understands yep. exactly mm -hmm. what you've just said. Mm -hmm. So let's rock and roll. Yeah. So let's first talk about how the interfaces look. Okay. Sort of show what I enumerable does and what I queryable does. Okay. Um, because the I queryable observable is slightly different from the I queryable. We sort of made it easier. Like hmm. we sort of reduced a little bit of curve that's on that interface. Um, and then we'll actually take a look at an implementation. I have link to WQL working, which will be a sample that we will ship. Right. And that actually shows how to write quick and dirty provider. Okay. Like I'm not going into the details of expression tree visitation or all that stuff. You could actually make the thing much better. Okay. But we're actually working on like toolkits that will enable you to do that, exactly that kind of stuff. Excellent. So let's talk about the interface a little bit yeah um, i think you can erase that we have it saved the whole, well yeah. if you want to i mean it's up to you actually i don't need it anymore okay so rock and roll well we've recorded it so yeah. it's now it's there for eternity it's in digital form yeah. man i have it in powerpoint slide as well so <laughs> we'll actually give that to the miners afterwards perfect as a picture so people can show it everywhere and make the tools if they want to do so perfect yep good so um on the left hand side i will write you know how i enumerable and i queryable look like okay. iEnumerable is something we don't need to talk about too much, but basically iEnumerable of T has a get enumerator method. 
And the interesting thing about get enumerator, I don't even care about return here, mm. is that that will be the thing that will trigger the compilation of your query. It's queries are lazy in length. Like you write a lot, you know, a lot of code from X and X's, which is a remote table, for example, and then you write a whole query. Mm. It's only when you start iterating that thing, which is really a call to get enumerator for mm. each, actually these sugars into a call to get enumerator. At that point, this query is evaluated. Not earlier. So, so this is a very important thing because it's the way to sort of go out of that world where you know things are abstract and just you know expressions mm -hmm. and sort of concretize the results that come with that. But that's sort of to escape from that. Okay. So in I observable we have the same thing. But there instead of you know getting something out, you push something in, which is a duality. I'm not going to talk about this one today. But so there we have a subscribe method. And that will also be, you know, the thing on which we hang up the compilation of a query. If you do subscribe, then we'll actually go to the server and say, please give me those results whenever you see them. Okay. That's where the translation will happen. Now we have derived interfaces from those guys. Here we have iQueryable of T. And here we have iQueryable observable of T. Okay? Okay. So they have those methods because they simply have an inheritance. So you can actually override those methods or implement them to, you know, do the query translation. Question is, where does the query live? Right. So you need an expression tree in here, and that's the infrastructure that we provide. If you start off with an iQueryable, like a link to SQL database table, mm -hmm. and you write a query using where select and all of those operators, you actually get an expression tree. And you sort of, what you do is you sort of circle between iQueryables. You have an I variable of product, you do where you get a new I variable of product, and so forth and so forth. So you stay in this world. Okay. Um, so that's actually what those interfaces are for. Um, the way they are implemented is they have a non generic interface as the base, which is I variable here and I variable observable without the of t here. Okay. The reason there is a non generic guy is because in a query translation, you typically want to do things like type checks. You want to see, like, I got something here. Is it something that can be remoted, or is it something that needs to be locally? Like, you know, for beta execution using IL code. So, um, because C-sharp doesn't allow you to do things like, is I enumerable of, I don't know what, I just want an I enumerable of something. Mm. You can't write this thing because you need to specify, you need to close this type using a concrete, you know, parameter. You can't do that, so you actually want a non-generic. Get to IE of var? Just kidding. No, actually, um, there, there are things, you know, like mumble typing. That's something yeah. that the C-sharp team has talked about. That's actually, you know, something that could work around this kind of problem. And sure. the bigger problem is actually that, you know, I enumerable of T, you know, are generics. Generics are like universal quantification. Yeah. You want existential typing to sort of work around some of those <laughs> issues. Existential typing. I like yeah. that. Excellent. So people who want more info on that can read the Probably go to Benjamin your... Pierce. Benjamin he, Pierce. He's a great, you know professor, I believe, at MIT or something, okay, um, who actually teaches all of that stuff, you know, of time systems. He has great books on this. Awesome. Okay. So we have those base interfaces, and for the rest, those guys don't implement anything, because the base interfaces will do all the hard work. Hmm. So the iQueryable interface that's sitting here, this guy, actually contains three things. It contains uh, three properties. One is called element type. Element type. Get only property. That basically will be the type of T hmm. in practice. Um, there is a slight difference in the sense that I queryable um, in the enumerable world actually implements I enumerable of nothing. The classic non generic I enumerable. So you could actually use this interface to do you know a query over something that doesn't have a type. That's like, you know, weekly type. This mm -hmm. is object. Um, so it has some additional benefit over there. But the nice thing is, like, using this thing, you can do something like, is it an like variable? And if so, what's the entity type or the element type? So that's actually the system.type representation of T, type of T. Okay. So that's what we have here. Secondly, we have the expression. Expression is also a get-only property. And the return type is expression from system link expressions. Mm -hmm. 
So if you do get on that guy, you basically get a tree that represents your query. Like it could look a little bit like select of where of source where with a lambda expression that goes from x to x is larger than zero and select that goes from lambda expression that goes from x to x plus one. So this is from x in source, where x is larger than 0, select x plus 1. That's basically the thing that the user wrote is basically encoded in this expression tree. The extension methods on iQuery will basically create those expression trees. Mm. So that's what those guys do. Okay. Um, let's detail that very briefly. So if you write queryable.where, which is an extension method on an iQuery will, right? This thing also takes in a func of t to bool, but not just a func, it takes in an expression of func from t to bool. Okay. That means if you write a query, which translates into calling the where map that use the where keyword, your lambda expression, like x goes to x is larger than zero, gets assigned to this guy, meaning the compiler gives you this code as data. Mm. Okay. So you have this code as data. Now you want to sort of stitch that together with a where call. You want to take the thing that you got from the compiler and you want to put a where on top of it, passing in this thing as the filter, what you got from the compiler, and basically give this thing back and stitch it into a new iQueryable of T that contains this whole thing. So mm. every time you do an additional operator, you get a bigger expression tree, bigger expression tree. It contains more and more information, and it acquires, you know, the method calls that you made on variable. The fact that you did a where, the fact that you did a select. So that's actually what those extension methods do. They basically stitch together expression trees. Now, I actually have an asset already, but like, you have where that takes in a filter. Okay. It basically wants to create, so it, it's where that takes in the left-hand side. Everything you wrote to the left of, you know, the where method, because it's an extension method, and it takes in the filter. What it needs to do is, this guy is an iQueryable of t, okay? What it needs to do is, it needs to create a new iQueryable of t. How can it create an instance of an interface? It needs to know, like, if this left-hand side is a table of t in SQL, the fact that you can call get enumerator on that table will cause it to translate into t SQL. Hmm. So what we need to do, if, if we attach a WHERE class on top of that thing, we need to have an iQueryable implementation that when you call getEnumerator, will again compare to tSQL. But we don't know the world, right? We, like, system.link can't know that there will be link to SQL, link to PowerPoint, uh, PowerPoint SharePoint, SharePoint, SharePoint. Uh, link to whatever. Like, they can't know, like, where to go to. So they need some help. Hmm. And the way they get the help is by actually a third member here that's something that's called provider and it returns an iQuery provider and that iQuery provider has a single method called create query and so what create query looks like so this is the iqp iQuery provider interface has a method called create query i'll just abbreviate it of return type r okay that takes in an expression tree a whole expression tree of type expression xpr and it returns an iQueryable of R. So basically what happens in queryable.where is the following. Let me actually write it completely down so that people don't get confused in any possible way. <laughs> so queryable.where takes in an iQueryable of T. Okay? Yep. Every queryable contains an expression that represents the query that the user wrote. So what we can do, if we call this thing L for left-hand side, we can do something like L dot expression. So in a query like, you know, access dot where, and you write the filter here, doing L dot expression will correspond to the expression tree that represents this whole thing, the whole left-hand side. Which could by itself be a where or an order by or a select or whatever, right? You can continue dotting into those guys. So you get that expression tree. What you do is you actually wrap it into a where method call expression, where of L 
top expression, which is the left hand side, together with the expression tree you get here for the filter, which is that lambda expression that gets assigned to this argument. Mm. So that's what you get from the compiler. The user writes x goes to x is larger than zero. This thing translates into an expression tree, and that's what's fed into this argument. Mm. It's also a system link expression. So you give that guy to where as well. Now you have an expression tree that represents, you know, a where method call where on the left hand side with a lambda expression from x goes to x is larger than zero. You have a new expression tree, and now you want to wrap it in an like variable that continues to stay in that domain, the domain of, for example, table of t or you know link to SQL. So what now happens is on L, you actually have a provider property. So you can do L.provider. Okay. The provider has a create query method that takes in an expression tree and gives me back an I queryable of R. So what we're going to do is we take this expression tree and we say L.provider.create query of this whole thing, which is the original expression tree stitched together with a where call on top of it. And then this thing returns an I queryable of R. In this particular case, it will be the same as T because where goes from IE of T to IE of T. It doesn't change the representation. Select would be different, right? It goes from T and goes to R. It projects something. So it changes. And so we return this guy and we have a new I variable of T. And so the thing is that you're sort of handshaking all the time. Like you have a query expression, you do dot where on it or dot select or any operator. What you do is you go back to the provider to ask like using create query, how do you create a query that you will still take responsibility over to execute? So you basically continue creating expression trees that are wrapped in like query will of these that correspond to SQL or WMI or something. Mm -hmm. So you stay in that domain, and that's why, the, why we have the provider. Now, you might actually think about something that we thought about ourselves when we were looking at this interface. Um, this interface is a little bit more complicated. I have to point it out. iQuery provider in the classic link world actually has four methods. It has create query of R, it has create query without an R, which is the non-generic guy. We don't care about that one because we only have generic types. Okay. We only have I innumerable, uh, I observable of T. We don't have a base interface. So we don't care about the non-generic guy and it has two other ones. And the other ones are very interesting. I query provider has an execute method, execute of R that returns an R and takes in an expression as the argument. This guy is called by the queryable extension methods that leave the monads. I'm going to use the fearsome word here. Uh oh. What does that mean? You have operations like, for example, sum in link to SQL. Okay. Sum is different from lots of other operations. What where does is it takes an iQueryable, it stays an iQueryable. It simply applies a filter to it and you get an iQueryable back. But the Things like sum, that's not the case. Like if this is your little world of I queryable of T and you do a where, you end up in I queryable of T again. Mm. If you do a select, you end up in I queryable of R, you know, select projects, but you stay in this IQ of something. Now, if you do sum, all of a sudden you leave it. Because sum will return a scalar value like an int. It doesn't return an I queryable sure. of int. Now that's good in a synchronous world. Because you're going to execute a thing on the spot. Maybe it's not that good actually. Because there's no way you can cancel it. But you know, it's a pool based interface. You can't cancel, you know, move next anyway. Mm. But in an asynchronous world, that's a problem. And that's the reason why in Rx we don't have operators that leave the mona, except for a few. Like mm. sum will be returning an iQueryable of n, uh, not an iQueryable, an iObservable of n. And the reason for that is that you can continue to compose. You can say I have a long sequence in the cloud that will execute, you know, takes 10 minutes to create a sum. But I want that thing to time out after five minutes. We have a great time lapse operator in, in Rx. We can take, you know, an iObservable, do the top timeout, and we get a new observable. That observable will get an exception if there was a timeout or the original data if there was no timeout. Mm. Now, if you would do this thing where you leave the monad and this thing would return an int, you can't compose on that. You don't have anything that's lazy anymore, make it too eager. 
So by actually staying in I observable, we can do things like timeout and all of that stuff. Okay. We just have a handful of operators that actually leave the monad, like first, last, and single. Those are the only ones that have, you know, intrinsic scalar value semantics where you just go out. But otherwise, the only way to get out of our observable is by using subscribe or run. You know, mm -hmm. those are the guys that leave the world. Just sort of drop things on the floor. In terms of, you know, not continuing. Drop having... things like side effects, you mean? No, no. It, it simply drops the eye observableness. Got right? it. You know, that, drop that... the type. Drops part of the type, yes. Okay. Sort of unravels it and just takes the T, not the IOZ of T. <laughs> um, and it exposes it to a lambda expression like the on next hand, right? Great. So we don't have this need to sort of leave the Mona. We don't need an execute because it's too eager. So that's something we don't have on this side. Mm -hmm. On this side, we, we got rid of execute. And also the non-generic execute, we also get rid of. Now people might wonder, like, what do you do if you want to execute remotely first mm -hmm. you don't want to get the whole sequence and throw everything away apart from the first element locally so we also have operators that are you know the same as first and last that actually stay in the monad so i observable of t goes to t for first okay so first leaves it but we also have like take if you do take one that's the same as first and that one stays in io of t so you always have a way to keep that thing remote. You can do first if you want like a total remote like first thing, you can use take zero uh, take one. And if you want to get the last, you can do take last of one. And those ones stay in IO of T, they don't leave. So those are the ones that you want to use for remoting or you know for cross translation using query provider infrastructure. So execute we don't need. Because okay. there are ways to do everything without needing such a method. Okay. Now, then you might actually think, and that's something we thought about ourselves at some point, iQuery provider has a create query method, just one method. Why don't we stick that method on iQueryable? We could just move it up. Um, that would work, um, but there was a refactoring done in like link to SQL and you know the classic iQueryable interface for a couple, well, for one good reason, I think. The reason is that the logic in create query might be shared across multiple implementations of our query. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But we didn't feel that that was compelling enough to actually do this. We found a better reason to have a query provider than the reason that Link to SQL and you know all the queryable providers actually have. Okay. The reason is that in queryable you can't do something as as the following. You can't do queryable dot range from zero to ten. What would it mean? If you do queryable dot range, mm -hmm. right? Queryable dot range zero to ten needs to return an i queryable of int. Okay, an i queryable. That's nice. But who is going to take the expression and translate it? If I do get enumerator on this thing, it needs to translate into something. Mm -hmm. We don't know who will take responsibility of translating the expression, like. Because we can't give 0 and 10 to, for example, SQL. Say, hey, SQL, please give me a table from 0 to 10. Well, 0 to 9, because this is a count. Mm -hmm. And 10 is not the upper bound. There's no way to tell somebody to create this thing. So what we've done is in the observable world, so queryable.range doesn't exist. Okay. We don't have that thing. But we can do it. We can say observable, queryable observable.range, 0 to 10, but it takes in an iQueryable observable provider, which is the dual to this guy, as the first argument. So you, and it actually is even an extension method. So what you can do is things like PowerShell.range. Hmm. That means that the PowerShell provider will actually get to Z0 to 10 and has a chance to actually translate it into 0 dot dot 9, which is the PowerShell syntax to do a range. And then you could pipe it to something else. So basically, by actually reusing this guy as the left-hand side for a lot of operators, we can do this sort of stuff. Similar for things like AMP and CONCAT. Like, there is an AMP overload that takes in N arguments using a params array. Well, you want to do an AMP, but who is going to execute it? Do we pick the first one? You might also be passing in a zero-length array. That means that we can't check for a zero-length array. We need to check because otherwise we can't tell anyone to, hey, please execute this. Mm -hmm. We don't have any left-hand side to stick the composition on. 
Mm. So instead, we have an NRE AND and CONCAT and CATCH that taken as the first argument when I query the observable provider. And you can do things like, you know, PowerShell.provide.m, pass in 15 sequences, and that means that PowerShell is going to raise them. Like, the race is going to happen in the cloud between all of those sorts. So those are the interfaces on the iQueryable side. I will erase <laughs> everything because it's actually pretty simple now to dualize that. We discussed everything. We actually said what we dropped. We said, like, we'll keep iQueryable as such. Okay. The element type expression, all of that stuff, that, that's goodness. Mm -hmm. We also need a provider because we're going to use that for range and amp and all of those guys, right? Yeah. So this is good, this is good, this is good. We drop three methods on iQuery provider. We don't need the non-generic guys. We don't need execute because we don't want to leave the monad. We want to stay asynchronous all the way to in the cloud. Okay. And only at the last point when you subscribe, you want to go synchronous. Potentially, okay. if you use run, you can stay asynchronous by using subscribe. And so on this side, we have non-generic iQueryable observable. That's exactly the same as this guy. The only difference is that the provider doesn't return an IQP, an iQuery provider, but it returns an iQueryable observable provider. And the iQueryable observable provider interface that's sitting here actually contains a create query of R that's the same, but doesn't return an iQueryable. Instead, it returns an iQueryable observable. Because otherwise, there is no way, you know, well, you don't sure. want, like, if you do dot .where on observable to get a query, because then you're going push to pull implicitly, which is not what you want. And we have more operators on either side. So we simply need to change that. It would be nice if the type system would allow to parameterize on the return type, but that's not, not something you can do. Like, mm. you want, like, higher parameterization capabilities in the type system to sort of merge those interfaces together, saying, you know, this is an iQuery provider, that works over the monad of iQueryable, or works over the monad of iQueryable observable, and you could parameterize on this guy. That doesn't exist. So we have to clone those two interfaces, mm -hmm. simply because we have one slight difference in the return types. But so that's what we have. Nice. Those are the interfaces. And that, but just to be clear, I mean, that's something we've learned, you know, from the very beginning. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's essentially the pattern of duality mm -hmm. uh, that exactly. you guys have yeah. developed. I yeah. mean, you, you sort of have to do it that way, given the types of constraint. Yeah. The, the so, interesting thing I want to say about that please. is um, it's dual on this level, right? You know, I queryable to I queryable observable. The duality sort of plays here. Get the enumerator subscribe. This one returns something. This one takes something in. Mm -hmm. A duality doesn't need to go in depth, meaning that you're not going to create a set only expression or element type and a set only expression and set only provider interface because if you if you look at my original diagram what you're dualizing is the horizontal axis that goes from ie to io that's dualization here okay the thing that changes here was the homo iconicity thing right? yes so that doesn't touch the interfaces if you walk that direction it actually keeps the context the same. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that an i enumerable versus an i queryable, an i queryable has an expression, an i enumerable doesn't. So actually, walking this direction means adding something that contains an expression tree. Hmm. Walking the opposite direction means getting rid of the expression tree. So duality means reversing arrows and signatures. Making something homo iconic means. Wherever you saw a funk of t to bool and a funk of this to that, make it an expression of a funk of this to that. Simply add something. Interesting. So And the interfaces need to be exactly the same, because otherwise something is broken there. Well, they can be a little bit more small and concise, because we can drop something. That don't make sense in our exclusively generic, don't leave the moment for world. So we can <laughs> sort of, you know, just keep that down. Exclus exclusively generic, don't leave the monad world. Yes. That should that's be our like, next t shirt. Bro. Yes, that will happen. That's a that's cool t shirt. Yes. I mean, oh, that's also. In, what the F Omega? F Omega is also a type system yeah. uh, with higher kinding support, which is a very interesting thing, actually, to help. Would have helped in this thing. particular case. It, it actually well might have helped, yes. Interesting. Um, and again, you know, if you want to learn more, 
good Benjamin or good luck. Pierce, Benjamin or Pierce. Benjamin Pierce. It's the authority on the field. He has a book, you know, called uh, Type Systems and Programming Languages. Excellent. The devil. And that actually contains... All that stuff. So let's, while we wind down here, mm -hmm. um, let's, because, you know, you've been very, very clear in your description. Mm -hmm. Let's now kind of, you know, build a conceptual expression tree mm -hmm. in some sense. Let's talk about how this is going to be used in the real world. Exactly. Okay. And we should show show show, show code, code, brother. Yeah. That'll work great. Okay. All right. Let's turn around here and see whether this thing is still awake. <laughs> of course it is. It is, but it's a little bit asleep. That's great. Okay. All right. I mean, I'm going to zoom in here. I'm actually going to reposition like, a little bit. A little bit. Bigger. You could make it a little bigger. That would always help because this is kind of old school. Feature in PS 2010. Yes, man. Nice. That's actually pretty clear. Not too much reflections. No, not too bad. It's fine. Okay. Well, I'm not going to show how a query provider is implemented because that's you know low level plumbing that that's done based on expression trees. You need to visit them, translate them, all of that stuff. Okay. I'm not going to show the internals of the beast. But so what this is is an event provider for WMI that uses link to WQL. Okay. So WQL is the WMI query language. It's a derivative of SQL with some different semantics, actually. It has some additional stuff and has removed some things and has different behavior here and there. Um, but you can use it to either query um, enumerable sequences, like please give me you know, all the processors in the machine. Or please give me information about all the volumes. You can do that, which is you know a pool-based mechanism. And I'm pretty sure that people have written link to WQL to do that, like mm -hmm. for the pool-based mechanisms. But you also have a push-based mechanism there. You have the concept of WMI events. Like, for example, notify me whenever a Win32 process is started. And so what I've done here is I've created a class, which is pretty similar to, like, you know, Entities in Link to SQL, for example, in Link to SQL you have rows and uh, you have columns and and you know a table. What you basically do is you put attributes on there that basically will indicate what the from class means and what you know those properties correspond to. For the properties, I don't need a mapping here because I'm simply going to use whatever is in the MOF scheme. That's the scheme that WMI uses to to represent um, represent management objects and management classes. So I have a process ID and a process name. If you look on MSDN for process start phase, you will see that those are the types of those properties. Okay. Um, and so now I can write events provider dot query of process start trace, which is sort of the same. It's a factory method for some reason here because I want to pass in a logger, um, which will basically do you know printouts of the the WPL statements that are created. Um, but this is conceptually the same as doing new table of T. New table of product and link to SQL. So this guy will actually listen for uh, with WMI eventing systems and um, to process start traces. And now I can do all sorts of things. I can use like they have domain specific um, query operators like within, which is a little bit like throttle and sample. It's on the edge. It's like specifying a polling interval. But you could right. use any observable operator to sort of hang on the within behavior. I just didn't find one that was actually ideal for that. So I, I just commented that one out. And it would actually not work because in this particular, you know, WMI event thing, the polling interval is not looked at. It's only looked at for what they call intrinsic events. So mm. but that's the detail. But so what's more interesting is, um, so first of all, events provider.query will actually return an iQueryable observable. Meaning that you have where and select and buffer with time, buffer with count, all the operators that we have, are available on iQueryable Observable. So because of that, I can write the where class and I can write a select and I can continue writing stuff. Maybe stuff that linked to you know WMI will not support, then at runtime you will actually detect that that's the case. But so here I will filter on the process name being Notepad and I will select out using the projection, just process name and process ID just to show that select can work too. Um, then I'm doing as observable. Which is, you know, our, if you remember the diagram, it's our horizontal movement. You yes. Know? It's, uh, no, it's the vertical one. It's the vertical one. It's going from I observable, I queryable observable to I observable. It's actually shaking off the expressionness of the thing. Yes. So okay. I'll right. actually post the diagram and you will actually see the arrow that you're walking. I remember. Down. Okay. So um, this guy returns an I observable of those anonymous guys. 
And now everything beyond that point will be locally. In a server so now in I L. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. It'll be local execution. So this thing will be timestamp. Timestamp is something that WMI doesn't know about. They don't know how to timestamp events, but we do locally. We can do that. So that's what, what I'm putting on there. So this little application uses very simple, simple query using links and tags. Um, on top of it, it has a thread that will actually create every two seconds, it will create an instance of Notepad. That's simply to illustrate that I will get the events. I don't want to go to start them during my demo. So I'm basically going to have a background here that will spawn processes that actually pass the filter that I have sitting here. And so when I execute this guy, you see that link to WQL actually translated the query expression into select process name process ID from win22 process start trace where process name equals notepad.exe. So that's the cross compile that actually was triggered by the subscribe to the uh, queryable observable. And what you're seeing here are the results that come back from WMI. Every time a process was started, we got an event. And then we also get a timestamp, which we attach locally to the events coming in. And so if I do start run notepad, you will actually see a notepad coming in. Yeah. When I do start run cal, you will not see anything coming in because it doesn't match the filter on the server. The server being the WMI infrastructure that, you know, filters, um, you know, somewhere in the kernel or, you know, the WMI infrastructure, they do that kind of filtering. Excellent. And we want yeah. that filtering to happen there because otherwise WMI is going to tell us every time a process is started. Which so is you're going to want. flood the system. Like yeah. If they can filter it, why would you filter it yourself? Perfect. So with this, you can actually remote those queries into some target domain. And it's also important in the mm -hmm. in the observable case, and mm -hmm. going back to the fact that the RX sort of the push model, yep. you're being pushed information exactly. from the operating system via WMI, via your, mm -hmm. essentially your filter, yes. which is what you've created in RX. RX yep. can also be thought of as yep. an eventing filter or a stream mm -hmm. filter. Yep. So it's the filter that the user wrote that gets, you know, translated into a Excellent. kernel concept. And it just game. came to you. So you could actually have your code. The beautiful thing is that because it's all asynchronous, your code could actually be doing many other things. Exactly. And as the yep. stuff comes in, other yep. parts of your app change. And I mean, yep. it's just a, it's a very yes, it's a traditional event-based kind of yep. model. And you're not, yeah, you're not blocked at all. And you're not wasting any CPU to do like, you know, filtering and all of that stuff because you're remoting it into the operating system. So Rx is essentially linked to streams. Right. It is, yes. Whether those streams are, you know, <laughs> verbatim execution in IL or something, you know, out of the process or even on the other side of the world, you can, you can do that kind Incredibly of stuff. Incredibly cool. So yeah. now, you know, this is going to be able to get in. So the Niners and a lot of people actually out there in community get very excited when you guys make mm -hmm. changes to RX. Yep. And so this is actually something that's going to be shipping in yep. your next release. Actually, the release is happening, was happening yesterday or today. Nice. We actually have it built and signed and everything. It's awesome. uploaded to the servers and it contains the interfaces. Excellent. So people can start playing. We'll actually try to ship the sample as well mm -hmm. somewhere in the near future. Um, which channel that will be most likely, you know, the blocks on the RX Steam log or something. Um, so people can find it there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I would invite people to think about, you know, everything you can translate into. Sure. Like every push-based model out there yeah. can be democratized using using RX. Excellent. Hey, man, always great to talk to you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Great job. And thank you for the very lucid explanation. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of concepts you explained today that are actually very clear. Mm -hmm. And I think people will appreciate that. Okay. So, uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Yep. Thank you. Take care, buddy. See you.